Welcome back to Mirror University. I'm your host, AJ, and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the world of Seaburn. We're also going to discuss a few real-world cases where Seaburn agents were used against people. To start off, let's talk about Seaburn, or CBRN. The C in Seaburn stands for chemical. Chemical agents can be anything from a household cleaner to industrial chemical, and anything up to a large-scale chemical warfare agent. A chemical agent is one which may be injurious to your body when it enters your system by being inhaled, eaten, or coming in contact with your skin. It could irritate, inflame, burn, destroy tissue, be absorbed into the bloodstream, or affect the body's functions. The B in Seaburn stands for biological. Biological threats can be anything like a virus, a toxin, or a bacteria substance that's going to cause an injury, a disease, or an illness in an individual. The R in Seaburn stands for radiological. This is any kind of radiation injury from things like nuclear waste or something like a dirty bomb. The N in Seaburn stands for nuclear. A nuclear threat is anything that's coming from a warhead, or it can be the resulting fallout from an explosion, including a thermal blast. Let's talk about the different types of chemical agents, starting with choking agents. Choking agents do exactly what it sounds like they do. They choke you. They irritate your nose, lungs, eyes, and breathing tract. Essentially, they are designed to be as uncomfortable as possible. If you've ever served, there's a high likelihood that you went through the tear gas chamber. I know that I did, and it was a pretty miserable experience. Everything that's wet in your body basically turns into fire. Your eyes burn, nose burns, can't breathe, feels like you're inhaling straight smoke and flames. We were herded into an innocent looking little building, which just happened to be full of tear gas. And then we had to take our masks off. We had to give our name, rank, and service number before they let us out, crying like babies. Oh man, that's smart. Next up, we have to talk about blood agents. Blood agents disrupt our body's ability to function properly by attacking our red blood cells. They stop them from being able to use oxygen properly. Think cyanide, for example. Next up, we have to talk about nerve agents. Putting it simply, nerve agents are nasty. They are designed to maximize suffering. They operate by disrupting the body's normal physiological functions, causing them to go haywire. Some examples of nerve agent are sarin gas, VX, and Novichok. These are designed as weapons specifically. Nerve agents can enter the body anywhere, inhaled through the nose and mouth, or absorbed through the eyes, or breaks in the skin. They take effect very quickly. They act upon the muscles of your body through the nervous system, both the voluntary muscles which obey your commands and the involuntary muscles, such as those which regulate your breathing, circulation, and digestion over which you have little or no control. Advanced symptoms of nerve agent poisoning are drooling and sweating, nausea, vomiting, or cramps, twitching, jerking, or staggering, headaches, confusion, or drowsiness, coma, convulsions, or stoppage of breathing. Last but not least, we have to talk about blister agents. Blister agents cause, well, blisters on any exposed area that they come in contact with. This includes skin and mucous membranes. Warning to the Axis. Deadly mustard gas fills these standard bomb cases, standing ready to meet enemy attacks if and when they come, ready to make payment in kind. Empty no longer, the cases are sprayed a dark gray, stenciled to tell the world what they contain. One hundred pounds of answer to the Axis, multiplied thousands and thousands of times. One hundred pounds of HS, king of battle gases. Let's talk about a few real world cases where people were exposed to chemical agents. To start off with, we have to talk about the Ohio train derailment, which occurred in February of 2023. 4,700 residents in East Palestine, Ohio, were affected by a train derailment. The accident released vinyl chloride and butyl acrylate into the air. Something like this is not only devastating for local population, but it is a reminder that things like this can happen in our very own backyards. Next, let's talk about some chemical agents that were used in the Gulf War, and more recently in Syria. 
Prior to the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein had a proven track record of using chemical agents against his own people and the Kurdish. Among those chemical agents were mustard gas, VX, and sarin agents. Saddam's history with chemical agents prompted the US military to upgrade its seaburn training for all military personnel. Another example of chemical agents being used against a civilian population took place in 2018 in Douma, Syria. The Syrian Air Force under the Assad regime dropped canisters of chlorine gas onto the local population, killing 49 people and injuring over 650. Videos from the scene show women, children, and other civilians foaming at the mouth and convulsing from the effects of chlorine gas. The regime also used chemical weapons elsewhere, as seen here in Aleppo. <laughs> While biological attacks are less common, in 2001, four letters laced with anthrax were sent through the U.S. Postal Service to prominent targets throughout the United States. This resulted in 22 individuals injured and five individuals dead. About 10.30 this morning, my office uh, opened a suspicious package. We conducted field tests. The first field test came back as positive for anthrax. The news reports following caused mass hysteria throughout the U.S. and incredible amounts of panic. It demonstrates the ability of someone to send a biological threat through the mail and effectively have it delivered to a target. You may remember the sarin gas attack on the Tokyo subway on the morning of March 20th, 1995. Members of the cult Aum Shinriko entered the subway and deployed sarin gas onto an unsuspecting civilian population, resulting in the death of seven people and the injury of over 500. Moving on to radiological threats, the two biggest ones we have to talk about are nuclear reactor meltdowns and also dirty bombs. The two most prominent nuclear reactor meltdowns that we're all familiar with were the Fukushima reactor meltdown in Japan and the Chernobyl nuclear meltdown in Ukraine. Both of these spread radioactive material out into the local populace, which will take decades to clean up and cause untold injury and illness amongst the population. In the two weeks since the accident, the Soviets claimed to have evacuated the population within 30 kilometers, contained the damage at the site, and begun decontamination of the area. Let's talk about dirty bombs for a second. Now, there are no documented cases of a dirty bomb ever being deployed in the real world, but that doesn't mean that they're not a credible threat. For the uninitiated, a dirty bomb is essentially an explosive device that is surrounded by radioactive material, whether that be pellets, toxic waste, or some other form of irradiated material. A dirty bomb is used to spread this material throughout a local population or city in order to leave the infrastructure intact, but disrupt the population, removing them, injuring them, and causing mass panic. Finally, we come to nuclear threats. Now, many of you may be familiar with nuclear threats, but let's break them down just a little bit. A nuclear threat comes from a nuclear warhead, which is attached to usually an ICBM. The resulting blast will cause thermal injuries and massive destruction, along with disruption from the fallout cloud, the iconic mushroom cloud that we're all very familiar with in feature films and media. So what are the answers to seaburn threats like this now that we've gone over a few real world examples? Well, first and foremost, the first thing that we have to do is we have to identify the threat. Now, in the immediate aftermath of a seaburn agent being deployed into a population, this can be difficult, but some of the things that you can do are paying attention to the local news, paying attention to situations in your area that may escalate, and just keeping your radio on and making sure that you're in the know about what's happening where you live. Next, we wanna make sure that we are avoiding the threat. And that can be as simple as staying away from large groups when tensions are high in your area, or making sure that we know when to shelter in place if an incident calls for it. Next up, we have to make sure that we are evading the threat. Now, whether that comes in the form of evading it by a shelter in place, or getting out of dodge with your go bag, one of the first things you have to do is make sure that we follow the steps in order. We know what it is, we've done our best to avoid it, now we have to move. Any bomb explosion may release war gas, so get upwind, for the person upwind is safe, even though close to the point of explosion. The gas vapors cannot travel into the wind. All war gases are heavier than air and hug the ground. So except in the event of a spray attack or other unusual circumstance, a level above the third floor line or equivalent height is also safe. 
but a man downwind, even at considerable distance, will be affected by wind-borne vapors. And lastly, one of the most important things any survivalist knows to do in a situation is to counter the threat head on. The best way to do that is with high quality gear, your gas mask, your hazmat boots, gloves, and a high quality filter. Thanks for attending Mirror University with us today. Make sure to share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more. Until next time, stay savvy, survivalists.